is John Flower. Do you all know him? So here he is. Thank you. How are you, John? Everything's great. Yeah? Yeah. So Aaron Boone said, you know, the other day at the Munson dinner, this team is pretty much the team that we're going to have, and barring any unforeseen acquisition, and we think that this could challenge for a championship. Do you think it's that good? I agree. Yeah, I mean, if you think about what Brian Cashman did this winter, bringing in Paxton and bringing back Hap, uh, the rotation is in good shape. The bullpen's unbelievable with Britain coming back and Adovino. And then you look at the lineup, you know, there's going to be some question marks in there. Gary Sanchez behind the plate, who's going to play first base. But I think all in all, this team is ready to go up against the Red Sox, and you got to find a way to beat them. All right, how is year two for Stanton different than year one, or does it just kind of stay the same? Well, I mean, obviously he's going to be more comfortable, but I, Don, I think he did a great job handling himself mm -hmm. in New York for the first year. Uh, I always pay attention after games, how he handles the media, how he handles questions, and I thought he was a rock star that way. I mean, the performance on the field may be up and down, uh, but played through injuries. I think he's going to come into spring training feeling a lot more comfortable knowing what it's all about playing in New York. You expect him to be a little bit better than he was last year. Who's the one player who you think a change in play could make a major back to the team this season a change in play meaning meaning their improvement this season would change the whole team uh, you know what I always look at behind the plate Peter and, and you know Gary Sanchez is the guy for me and I, I kind of feel like this season for him is it's time to go do it and kind of be that all-star on both sides of the baseball stay healthy um, run down the line every day uh, you know when he when he's in there and kind of take it to the next level last year was such a disappointment I expect him to get a lot better but when I go to spring training he's gonna be the first guy I'm paying attention to every day how does DJ LeMayu fit in where does he play I was shocked with that signing I don't know how you felt about it I was Michael. Surprised. yeah and uh, you know everybody that I talked to at the winter meetings they felt like they want to keep Glaber at second on a consistent consistent basis and then you sign LeMayu so how is that going to work and the Yankees also talk about playing third base playing first base like it's going to be that easy for him I don't see that being that easy to be a utility guy who's going to find four at bats every night all around the infield so Aaron Boone's going to have a lot of decisions to make not only with his infield but with some of the outfield guys in the rotation hey because I guess the analytics Michael right they, they don't want you to play 162 right so if there's going to be 25 days off for the entire infield that still doesn't give you 500 at bats right now I guess the big question is when is DD coming back the organization believes it's gonna be sooner than later but you do hear rumors Tommy John surgery that this could be long like Sexton in Los Angeles ended up being a long time so do you have any idea when we might be able to see Didi? No, I mean, I'm hearing July 1st. I think that's optimistic. That's very optimistic. Very optimistic. Yeah. So I would plan if I was the front office sometime in August. And now that gets back to Tulowitzki. What's he going to be? Even if he goes to spring training and he plays maybe four or five days a week and stays healthy, can he continue that for four months into the season? If he can, then what a great signing that's going to be. If he can't, then all of a sudden Glaber's going to be moving all over the place. And I think that's when things get a little confusing. A little later on in the show uh, and he'll be at the dinner tonight we're gonna have Luis Severino on and in the first half of the season he was about as good as any pitcher in baseball including Chris Sale yep. anybody you want to mention and the second half of the season it was a mystery to me and then we find out he might have been tipping pitches do you think it was about tipping pitches or did the league figure him out? No, I definitely think the tipping pitches was a big deal. I also think what was downplayed was him throwing over 200 innings the year before and then coming back and all of a sudden his trouble started happening right around the middle of the season and you wonder if fatigue maybe was a problem and then you couple that with tipping pitches. Now all of a sudden you're going out there hoping for the best and, and you can throw 98 miles an hour, you know this Michael, at, at the big league level if you don't locate, if you don't hit your spots, if you you're tipping, you're going to get beat up. And I did an event with Luis this winter, and he was very open about it. And that's something that they've addressed, something that he's going to have to work on and continue to work on because it's so easy for pitchers to fall back into some bad habits with tipping pitches. Yeah, and I think the game where it really came to a head for me was that Met game on that Sunday night where the Mets were laying off that slider. I yep. mean, it's a filthy slider, but if you know what's coming, you just don't swing at it because it's rarely ever a strike. What are some of the things you think batters pick up on to see that that's coming? Well, we did a we did a hot stove show this winter, Don, on and really detailing what he was doing, and he would actually look towards third base when he was throwing a fastball or a slider. I don't remember which one it was, 
but it was so blatant when you saw it on video and you, and you were looking for it that you could see it clear as day. He was also doing something with his glove high or low, which was always something when I was playing. Kirk Gibson was a master at picking up pitchers who were tipping. It would always be fanning the glove or going high and low depending on coming out of the stretch or the windup. Luis was doing multiple things. So you couple that with that getting around the league and then you get to the playoffs where we saw the Boston Red Sox bench actually calling out pitches before they were delivered. There was a lot going on. So it's as simple as just sort of a weird habit that you happen to naturally yes. develop with each pitch. Yes. It becomes something that's habitual where they, they'll look in, they'll get a sign and maybe it's a change up and they start fanning their glove and they don't even think about it and there are hitters who won't even look for it. But if somebody picks it up, it starts spreading around the league and it's something you have to figure out. And wow. all the times that you play, John, who's the best guy, teammate or coach that was a sign stealer from the bench? It was Kirk Gibson and Mickey Tettleton in yeah, Detroit. Right. And they would tell me, and I was a young kid at 26 years old, first time playing every day, and they would say by the third inning we were going to have every pitch this guy is throwing. And they would do and it for they, everybody. They would do it for everybody. And they would be locked in from the first. And they made a living as an older player where they might get beat with a fastball. But when they know it's coming, they right. can cheat a little bit, take care of it. And Kirk Gibson would also set up left-handed relief pitchers when he would know when that breaking ball was coming. Would swing wildly at the first one, baiting him into throwing it again. And then he would set him up and, and drill it. Now, did wow. you have did you have pitchers that tipped and you had to try to work them through it? We we did, and but my problem is I'm thinking about game plan. I'm thinking about runners on base, so I can't really pay attention mm -hmm. to who's tipping and trying to pick something up on it. Wade Boggs in Tampa Bay would go to the bullpen when pitchers would throw their side session and would be locking in trying to pick something up on it. Now with all the video, you would expect that this would be something that would be easy to pick up on. Now, not to play pop psychologist, but I would just think, because it's just like having a tick like in human nature. We yep. all do some things that, you know, whether it's OCD. Like you with or, the pen. Right. But <laughs> so if you took the pen away, I would think I'd replace it with something else. Maybe I would tap my foot. Maybe I'd use my finger. So is there a feeling that, all right, he stops fanning with the glove or he stops looking at third, but he'll replace it with something else? Of course. That's something that you'd have to pay attention to. So you have to scout yourself. Of I think the organization has to scout yeah. these guys, yeah, that's actually. What I, mean. yeah. I, I would say that, you know, Tim Nearing was an ex-teammate of mine with Boston, very good at tipping pitches. So I would think that there would be video that would be sent around the organization. We think something's going on here. Watch this, see if you can find something so we can take care of it with our player. We're talking with John Flaherty of the Yes Network here on the Michael K Show. Uh, you, you played baseball for a long time. You've been an announcer for a long time. The fact that it's February 8th and Bryce Harper and Manny Machado are unsigned. Does that stun you? Oh, I'm shocked, of course. Yeah, and I, I think back to my days as a player. If you weren't signed by Christmas and New Year's, you start, you start panicking. Right. Right. And you start panicking. You have a family to think about. Where are my kids going to be? You know, where do I set up shop? And it becomes a full-blown panic. I couldn't even imagine getting into February. And, you know, these two players are going to get nice deals. They're going to end up in a good spot. But it's got to be stressful for those other guys out on the market who are 31, 32 years old. And you're looking at the reality that you might not have a job in a couple of weeks. And your career could be over. I was talking to a guy the other day. I was talking to an agent. And he said... There's no collusion. He said they finally just figured it out. He it's said smart. if you look at war historically, he said war has a precipitous drop after the age of 32. Yep. He said they finally figured it out. How do you legislate against smart? I totally agree. And, and the one year that I could have been a free agent, well, was after, after this contract. I was 31 years old. Right. Right. And I think back now, if I was a free agent at this time, 31, I'd be, have trouble finding a job. And I ended up signing a three-year deal on my past performance the year before. Which they never do. Which they are not doing anymore. And they, they've smartened up. And I also think there's some things with the, uh, the CBA, maybe, that the union didn't do such a great job in signing this agreement mm -hmm. that is keeping some of the spending down. So there's a combination there that these free agents are in a tough spot. And I'm just wondering, not that any of the fans are going to feel bad for him, but is Scott Boris becoming a dinosaur? Is he almost obsolete? Remember, he was the one that would send organizations like spiral notebooks full of information yeah. that they already have now. So I'm just wondering, are all those types of agents now becoming obsolete? Yeah, he would sell his player to an organization. This is why you need mm -hmm. my guy. And you're right, Don. I think those days are over. And I think it's getting to the point, and it it probably has to get to this point that that middle-of-the-road free agent 
better take a job to get service time and pension time more than the millions of dollars that he was hoping for to try to get to that 10 year being a free uh, a full-time pension player I got to tell you John I've known you a long time that's one of the most beautiful shirts it's really nice worn. it's gorgeous it was a, a great Christmas gift that I broke out just for the it's show really so. it's tremendous I, really I, you know, I'm, I'm, I can't even talk right now. Everybody's laughing. No, but I, it's, it's, it's a great not a joke. It's, a, it's not a joke. I never get these compliments when we're in the booth together in mid-August either, and listen, by the way. Nice shirt is a nice another way of saying nice body, too, because oh, that makes it work. Wow, wow. Now I'm going to start blushing. Yeah. Now I'm going to start you should feel awkward. Right John, good to see you. I'll see you great at the dinner, right? Great to see you right? guys. Yeah, look All forward right. to it. That's John Flaherty, everybody.